Song of Songs um, is, comes from the Hebrew Shir Hashirim. Uh, it's a superlative, the Song of Songs, the best song. Well, in terms of the literature of the Bible, it's the most sexually evocative of the books of the Bible. The Song of Songs is also known as the Song of Solomon. It used to be called Canticles in some older versions of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, if it's, here it is, wow. So you can see it's about halfway through. It is ascribed to the King Solomon, a famous Jewish king who lived long ago, probably 10th century BC. The opening lines say, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So people interpret that different ways. Some people would interpret that to mean it's by Solomon. Although I think scholars now believe it was written by someone much later. It's really a love poem between two, a man and a woman. But of course, historically, the church has always uh, turned it into an allegory or a symbol. It's extremely influential. Um, and this goes right back into the Middle Ages. Chaucer quotes it, Shakespeare. Yes, it's very saucy. It's very, uh, as I say, full of very explicit physical language of love. It's hard to choose the best um, passages. Some of them describe the lover. Um, famous passages, how beautiful you are, my love, how very beautiful your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving down the slopes of Gilead. Your lips are like a crimson thread and your mouth is lovely. And so on, and it goes on to describe your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. And there are parts where you start to wonder, you know, is this even appropriate to be in, in a holy book? Throughout the history of, of having the Song of Songs in the canon, so in the Jewish Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible, and the Christian Bible, there's this big question, how do we interpret it? Because on the surface, it looks pretty erotic, it looks pretty dodgy. How can we include this profane stuff in Holy Scripture? And we've got two, basically two sides uh, of an answer. One is that this is some kind of allegory. Uh, so this is actually talking about the relationship between God and his people, whether it be Israel, whether it be the church. On the other side, this is truly some human love poetry, which is telling us um, about God-given love, which is telling us about the relationships between men and women. This is why it's in scripture, this kind of thing. Very interesting that Origen actually says only those who are spiritually aware or educated to a certain extent should be allowed to read the Song of Songs. He was afraid that those who were not prepared to understand it in an allegorical way would actually be drawn into lustful thoughts and eroticism if they read it wrongly. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on again? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved thrust his hand into the opening and my inmost being yearned for him. But the question is, is this a description of Whoa. human love? Or, I don't, <laughs> I think it's all the natural imagery of the Song of Songs, but, yeah. um, <laughs> Ah, well, um, yeah, just carry on. <laughs> Look, there's a bit of love. <laughs> yeah. Creations of fundamentalists will always say the Bible must be taken literally. There must be, must be inerrant, no mistakes in it, in terms of this literal truth. For example, they'll say to us, we must approach Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, as six days of creation being literally six 24-hour periods. But if they're going to maintain that, what we should insist, or what should be insisted, is that they read the Song of Solomon literally. Now that would be the most erotic, blue interpretation ever. And if they're not going to read it literally about breasts and about desire, if they're not going to read that literally, then how do they then, how do they legitimate the fact that they're insisting we all read other books only literally? There is this interesting, um suggestion that the female lover, the bride, is black, um, that she was the Shunammite, um, Solomon's lover. I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun is gazed on me, and so on. If you interpret that in a literal way, you would understand she probably had African origins uh, whoever it was that this song was written about. 
And if you've ever been to the south of France or Spain, you may have seen these statues of the Madonna, the Virgin Mary in some churches called the Black Virgins, which are carved out of ebony. People have always debated why they're always black. And one suggestion, it's not proved, but it's very likely, I think, is that they are inspired by the Song of Songs and the association of the Virgin Mary with this poem. It's interesting, because though some people argue that there are no explicit references to, to God in the Song of Songs, uh, verse 6 can be understood as referring to uh, Israel's God using the divine name. Love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Okay, this phrase, a raging flame, in other English translations, I think uh, the new ESV, uh, refers to flashes are flashes of fire, flames of God. Okay, a flame of God. Now the reason for that is that in Hebrew, uh, what you find in the Hebrew Bible here, so I'll just look at that. Okay, so yeah, chapter 8, verse 6 in uh, Song of Songs, so in the Hebrew Bible here. So the noun is, is flame, but it's, it's, it ends, it has a suffix, yah, which is the beginning of the divine name uh, in Hebrew. Okay, and now the suffix can uh, serve to mean a flame of God, but it can also serve to make the noun into a superlative. So a big flame, a mighty flame, and that's actually what a lot of the English translations like the NIV, the NRSV do, refer to a mighty flame. But there's some ambiguity in here. So it can't be ruled out completely that there's not one single reference to God in Song of Songs. That can be translated in that way. Okay.